So heroin was actually originally marketed as a child's cough suppressant uh, back in the early 1900s. It was legal for about 20 years. You could buy it over the counter. And then society realized that was a really bad idea. I am Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching A Lawyer Up. And today we're going to be talking about the history of the drug heroin. We're going to talk about its original creation and use. We're going to talk about its recreational use today. We're going to talk about how it's created, where it comes from, the various forms of heroin, and kind of where our supply chains are coming from with the illegal drug cartels of both Mexico and Colombia. If you enjoy the episode, smash that like button for me. If you got something to say, comment below. If you want to learn more about the law and topics such as these, subscribe to the channel. And if you have friends who would enjoy this type of content, share me on social media. And as with all of my history of drug episodes, this is in no way meant to condone the use of drugs. Uh, in fact, with heroin, it is one of the most addictive, uh, most deadly substances uh, that is used recreationally in the world. I would never suggest anyone even experiment with heroin. Uh, heroin ruins lives, it ruins families, and it ruins communities. So the information in this video is for infotainment purposes only. Now when we're talking about the history of heroin, we have to start with a discussion of opium from which it is sourced. And opium is the psychoactive component that is found in the poppy seed plant. The opium is actually obtained by scoring or cutting the poppy seed uh, and a white uh, milky uh, substance leaks out. It's called uh, the milk of the poppy or poppy tears. So this opium sap or this opium gum, it is a uh, essentially a sticky yellowish sap and it contains three different alkaloids. An alkaloid is simply a fancy word of a substance that occurs naturally that has a kind of a physiological effect on the human body. So this opium sap or this opium gum, it contains three components. It contains codeine, it contains morphine, and it contains thebaine. Now when we're talking about morphine, most people are familiar with that. It is used medicinally uh, throughout the world for uh, acute injuries and or situations uh, post-surgery for uh, severe pain. It's used in the United States in all of our hospitals and by the United States military. Morphine is also what is processed further to create heroin, uh, a substance that's used recreationally that is twice as potent as the original morphine. Interestingly, while morphine remains the pain-killing choice in the United States, in the UK, they use heroin medicinally in their hospitals and after surgeries. It's more potent, so they use less of it, but they're actually giving people heroin in the hospitals in the UK. Now, in addition to morphine, this opium sap contains codeine, and codeine is used as a cough suppressant and also as an anti-diarrheal medicine. And the opium sap also contains the thebaine, and this is the active ingredient that is processed further uh, that essentially gives us our opioid pain pills. This is where our hydrocodone or Vicodin comes from, and our oxycodone with the well-known name of oxycontin. Uh, that is the substance from which which uh, those opioid pain pills are created. Now, if you want to know more about uh, opium, uh, thebaine, and codeine, you can watch my other video on this channel entitled The History of Opium, because today we're talking about the history of heroin. Now, while opium use dates back to 5000 BC, where it was originally indigenous to the Mediterranean basin, and that's the area around the Mediterranean Sea in Europe and Asia and Africa. And originally, opium was used as a sedative and for pain relief. However, it was difficult 
because you had this opium product, but you really didn't have any way to measure the amounts of the codeine, the morphine, and the thebaine that was contained in the opium product. That was until 1804, where morphine was first isolated out of opium. The benefit was now you had pure morphine that could be dosed at therapeutic levels, and you knew exactly what the product was going to give you with a particular patient. And by 1827, morphine Morphine was being sold commercially by a Heinrich Merck in Germany. Uh, he started a little company called Merck Pharmaceuticals, which today is the oldest pharmaceutical company on planet Earth. Uh, and they have trillions, not billions, but trillions of dollars in assets worldwide. So from there, morphine was sold and used medically uh, as a sedative and a pain relief agent for about 40 years. The one big drawback with morphine is that it was addictive and it caused serious withdrawal symptoms with patients. So the medical professional said, hey, we need something else that we can use that's not as addictive as morphine. So the chemist, they started monkeying around uh, with morphine. Uh, one arm of study had them boiling uh, morphine with various acids in an attempt to create a new substance. And they did. In 1874, diacetyl morphine or diamorphine or heroin was first invented. And this particular product was twice as potent as morphine. And although it existed in about 1875, it wasn't pursued commercially until right around the turn of the century. That was when Felix Hoffman of Bayer Corporation, B-A-Y-E-R, you've probably heard of them as well, uh, he took heroin and pitched it to the German government as the non-addictive replacement or substitute for morphine. And the government bought it and they approved Bayer to sell heroin commercially in Germany. So from 1900 to 1920, heroin was marketed and sold uh, as a children and adult cough suppressant, a sedative, and a painkiller. And although it was marketed as a non-addictive substitute for morphine, it only took about 20 years for people to realize, hey, wait a minute. This is not non-addictive. This is way more addictive than morphine. And after figuring that out, uh, morphine was declared illegal worldwide by about every country uh, by 1930. So as the story goes, the team from Bayer was uh, somewhat frustrated and they were defeated uh, that their product of heroin was no longer able to be marketed and sold. So they had to go back to the labs, go back to the drawing board, uh, and what they created was kind of a project they had sat on the back burner. It was acetosalicylic acid, uh, or aspirin, which uh, you probably know today, Bayer Corporation has done quite well with that product. It's not heroin, but they've done pretty good with aspirin. But regardless, by 1920, the cat was out of the bag, right? People knew about heroin, uh, and people, a lot of people really, really liked it. So even though it was declared illegal uh, medically, illegal commercially, it was still being used uh, and catching on around the world recreationally. So when we talk about using uh, heroin recreationally, you can snort it, you can eat it, you can smoke it, and you, of course, can inject it. In fact, injecting heroin is uh, the fastest way, obviously, to get the drug into the bloodstream. Injection gives you that rush that people talk about that use heroin. Also, injecting is the most dangerous way to use the product. Not only is there the high potential of overdose, but there's also the blood-borne illnesses uh, that accompany any drug that is injected with needles. And there are different types of heroin. There's white heroin. Uh, there is brown heroin, there's black tar heroin, and then there's various mixes of those with each other and with other drugs. And we're gonna learn about each one of those uh, when we talk about how heroin is made. So let's fast forward to today. Today, Afghanistan and Pakistan produce about 70% of the world's opium and thus about 70% of the world's heroin. And you would think that is where America's supply comes from, but it's not. Most of the heroin in the United States comes from Mexico and the Mexican drug cartels and Colombia and the Colombian drug cartel. So let's talk a little bit about how heroin is made. 
Now it all starts with the farmers in the field. And farming a poppy uh, plant field is about 10 times as profitable as say farming wheat. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot of convincing to get these farmers, especially in Afghanistan and Pakistan, to trade out their wheat farms for an opium poppy plant farm. But what these farmers do is they remove the poppy seed, and as I mentioned earlier, they cut it or they score it. This is, allows the uh, poppy uh, milk of the poppy or the white uh, substance to leak out. Uh, ultimately, it will dry into that yellowish, sappy gum or latex substance that they scrape up and they put together and they form what are called latex or gum or sap bricks. And it's these raw opium gum bricks that are usually sold to the drug cartels for further processing. Now, once the cartels get a hold of these gum bricks, they move into the morphine step. And that's the step where you extract the morphine out of the opium brick. The way they do that is they put these raw opium bricks into a hot water bath. Uh, then they mix in calcium hydroxide. It's called quicklime commercially. Uh, some other people use ammonium chloride. But what happens is it causes the substance to separate uh, from the rest of the liquid and you see a morphine band. It's a white substance that floats to the top of the water bath uh, and that is the morphine. That is then siphoned off, it's filtered, and what you're left with is a morphine base or morphine free base. This morphine free base is then allowed to dry and put into bricks of its own. Now you can smoke or you can ingest this morphine free base and it will have an effect on the body, uh, but most people will process it further into the more potent heroin. So once you've extracted the morphine and you've put it in its own morphine brick, you take that brick and you put it back into another hot water bath. Only this time we're adding sodium bicarbonate, which is basically just baking soda, and acetic anhydride. And this is the key ingredient that you really have to have uh, to make high quality heroin. It in and of itself is a regulated substance. It's not easy to get your hands on since it's independently regulated itself. Acetic anhydride is also what goes into and is the key component in making aspirin. Although the end result is obviously quite different than from heroin. Now a lot of illegal uh, labs that cannot get their hands on acetic anhydride will substitute acetyl chloride, which is not an otherwise controlled substance, uh, but it yields an, an inferior level of heroin. In fact, in a lot of lower level labs where they don't have access to all of the proper chemicals or the equipment, uh, they produce a low quality heroin that's referred to uh, on the streets as black tar heroin. Now, some people prefer this and it's really a lot less expensive than say white or brown heroin but it's considered a lower quality, uh, kind of like crack being compared to cocaine. Now, once that morphine brick is uh, mixed back into the hot bath with the additional components added in, it again separates and the heroin is created. Uh, it is siphoned off of the hot bath. It is put through a filtering process and then ultimately allowed to dry. The remaining product is a brown powdery substance that is heroin. Uh, it's called throughout the world different things. Uh, it's mostly called Afghan heroin. Uh, the brown Brown heroin in the United States we call Mexican heroin, primarily because the Mexican cartels are the ones who create it. And this Mexican or Afghan brown heroin, uh, it can be smoked, uh, it can be ingested. Uh, it is not water soluble in and of itself, so it's not popular for people who inject it. However, you can create a substance uh, uh, when you add in a mild acidic uh, and some heat. You see people with spoons and their lighting the spoons, uh, what they're generally doing is taking heroin that is not water soluble and they're mixing some sort of an acidic product with it. A lot of times that will be uh, lemon juice or vinegar uh, and then they heat it to speed up the chemical process. What that does is it breaks down the brown heroin uh, so that it fully dissolves in the water or the substance so that it can be injected. Now people that don't want to fool with that process uh, with the brown heroin will take 
a next step, and that is the production or the transformation of brown heroin into white heroin. And in the United States, this is generally done primarily by the Colombian uh, drug cartel. And what they do is they take your brown heroin and they add diethyl ether and hydrochloric acid, which creates a diamorphine hydrochloride, which is essentially white powder heroin. And the advantage to white powder heroin is that it is water soluble and it can immediately be dissolved into water and injected without any other type of uh, agent being added to it. So that's the various types of heroin. And now let's talk a little bit about where it comes from in the United States. And I've repeatedly talked about uh, the Mexican drug cartels and the Colombian drug cartels, which give us uh, most of the heroin we see in the United States today. Now, when we're talking about the Colombian uh, drug cartel, we are talking about the Medellin or Medellin cartel, which was originally headed up by Pablo Escobar. They specialize in white heroin and it's sold uh, primarily uh, east of the Mississippi in the United States. Uh, and they use the old Colombian drug routes and their established relationships they've been using for years when at first they were bringing in cocaine and now they have invaded the heroin market. So you see white heroin primarily coming from the Colombian drug cartel uh, and being sold east of the Mississippi River. Now, west of the river, you see the uh, cartels from Mexico, uh, primarily the Sinaloa cartel, who was uh, previously headed up by El Chapo. Uh, they are big into the brown heroin and the black tar heroin, which is primarily what you find uh, west of the Mississippi. Now, of course, this heroin doesn't just stay on one side of the river. You can find different types of heroin about anywhere in the United States. But those are the areas where they are primarily introduced uh, into the uh, United States. And just as a frame of reference, I have a, a criminal case I'm handling now uh, where it involves somebody who is uh, selling, uh, buying and selling white uh, powder heroin in St. Louis, Missouri. Right now, you can purchase white powder heroin for about $1,800 an ounce. Now, if you bust it up and you sell it by the gram, you're getting about $150 a gram, which means that on an ounce, uh, a dealer can make about $2,500 uh, by busting it up and selling it in individual quantities. And that, of course, is the highest quality uh, white powder heroin. You're gonna pay less uh, for brown heroin and you're gonna pay a lot less for black tar heroin, uh, which sometimes you can find on the streets for as little as five bucks a hit. And of course, there are various mixes of all the above. They call this a scramble, where you may have white mixed with brown. Uh, or you may have brown mixed with some other drug. Uh, they scramble things all up and uh, there's sometimes there's no telling what you're going to get in your heroin. Uh, if it's been infiltrated with some other substance, they refer to it generally as a scramble. And of course, one of the most deadly combinations of heroin is mixing it with cocaine. That gives us a speedball, which has taken the lives of many an American and many a celebrity. The speedball is, and I'll read the list, uh, responsible for the deaths of uh, John Belushi. Uh, Chris Farley, River Phoenix, uh, Lane Staley, comedian Mitch Hedberg, and actor Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, all speedball overdoses and deaths. And now the newest craze in the uh, heroin world is lacing it with fentanyl or fentanyl, depending upon uh, where you're from and how you pronounce it. And this is incredibly bad. Uh, this is a product that has all kinds of overdoses. And here's why. I'm going to uh, read to you the comparison chart on opioid um, potency. So when we talk about relative potency, it's always compared to uh, morphine. Morphine is basically base one. So codeine is about half the potency of morphine. Uh, so it's a half uh, if morphine is a one. And when you can compare it to other opioid products, a hydrocodone is the equivalent uh, potency of morphine. Now heroin, of course, is twice as potent uh, as morphine and also oxycodone is twice as potent uh, as morphine. So when you're taking those types of pills, that is the functional equivalent of taking that dose of heroin. Now the reason fentanyl is so bad is that when we're talking about relative potency, 
Fentanyl is a hundred times as potent as morphine and 50 times as potent as heroin. So you can see why even just a little bit of that can cause a person to pass out. And if you take uh, or ingest uh, more than just a bare minimum, it's killing people left and right. If you're interested in learning more about fentanyl, there is another video on this channel about heroin, fentanyl, and addiction that I would encourage you to watch. Otherwise, that's today's episode on the history of heroin. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, smash that like button for me. If you have friends that you think might enjoy uh, this channel, share me on social media. And if you wanna learn more, subscribe to the channel. I'm Joshua Roberts. I thank you for watching today's episode.